Hi there, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I'm excited to welcome guest Richard Feldman, creator of the Rock programming language, which aims to be fast, friendly, and functional. And as usual before an interview, let's take a quick look at a demo of the language. Now, for Rock to write any kind of application, you have to build on some kind of platform, and then you can use things from that platform and provide things back to it for your application. And this demo here is a variation on things I've done for other languages in the past, where I pretend to read using some kind of fake HTTP client, and I get back a document if there's no error, which might have a head, and the head might have a title. Then I can make summaries of that, and I can track various kinds of errors if I want to. So here I have a function read doc, where I pretend to read things just based on the text of the URL. Then I can build a summary, or I can have a helper that reads and then builds a summary, which might be an error if we failed to read the document at all. A different kind of summary might be just whether the title is empty or not. And I purposely set this up to be as extreme as possible of having some result, which might be successful or error. And then if it's successful, you might have a Boolean, depending whether the title was there in the first place or not. Then in main, I just loop through a variety of fake URLs, provide a summary, and or that just doesn't have a title summary. And here I also have various helper functions, part of which are just about debug formatting, which will be automated for simple types in a future version of Rock. And I also made a couple other simple helper functions. So let's try this out. And here we see output is expected for the various fake documents I'm reading. To understand a bit more of what's going on here, since Rock is a functional language, my loop here actually is more of like a fold or a reduce, where I start with an empty OK task, and I build on that task using callbacks as I go along, sort of continuation passing here. And each time through the loop, I build up the next round of a task with a print line. So this here is a lambda, and to understand, this also is a lambda. Alternative syntax for this would be like so. Here I get a useless parameter, sort of a unit type, an empty record, so I don't care about the content of it. And this is a different way of saying the same thing. Let's try it again. Yay, it worked. Go back to the old syntax where it's flatter. And look at a little bit of other stuff too. These type definitions here are not nominal, they're structural. So for example, if I take this doc here and I inline it, it still works as before. Maybe just to prove that it actually has an effect, I'll put a different type there that won't work. We see we got some error messages. Let's go back to how we were. And I haven't specified exactly what kind of error type I want here. I'm just letting it be inferred. Where the kind of error I might provide because of context is a bad read. And these tags, which are sort of like, say, enums in Rust or tagged unions, they're just called tags in Rock, and they're never defined anywhere. They're just part of a global enum namespace. And we'll discuss more of that later. They also have no maybe type, so I'm just saying, I could use the tag missing for the error case for my own kind of maybe handling. And behind the scenes, Rock compiles all of this down to efficient machine code. And it even has full program type inference if you want to use it. I don't need to be explicit on my types. So back to the interview, I'll be joining forces today with Chris and Andre of the Code Next Door YouTube channel. And part two of this interview is gonna be on their channel. So make sure to go there afterward. And as usual for my interviews, I provided visual background on my own after the fact. Let's get started. To start with, could you please introduce yourself? Yep, I'm Richard Feldman. I created the Rock programming language. And how did Rock get started? So I'm a big fan of Elm. Uh, like I wrote the book Elm in Action. I've taught uh, like intro to Elm and advanced Elm for front end masters. And I, there were all these different domains where I really wanted to use an Elm like language, but that wasn't really available because Elm's sort of very focused um, on like currently like just uh, front end web development. And this this sort of like laundry list started piling up and up. Uh, and then separately, I'd also had a variety of ideas for things that I thought might have made sense in Elm, but maybe it was like kind of too late or didn't make sense for Elm specifically, but maybe for an Elm-like language might have made sense. And one thing led to another. And eventually I just kind of thought, you know, I'm just going to make this language um, and then I can use some language like this in all these different domains. So that was kind of the, the catalyst. Okay, very cool. And in terms of like, so you started it, but GitHub suggests that you already aren't the largest contributor in terms of the That's amount right. of code. So how does like decision-making work on Rock? 
So basically, uh, I, I like to use the term BDFN, so benevolent dictator for now. Uh, so basically, I, I kind of have the final say on everything for the time being. Uh, the explicit plan is to transition that to some sort of different model, but uh, there's no like particular timeline on that. Um, it's really just kind of like right now it's sort of efficient. And also it, it's worked out for a lot of languages, especially in the early stages. So I think that makes the most sense for now. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the one person who has more commits than me is Folkert. Shout out to Folkert. He's awesome. He's He's been an amazing, amazing contributor. It's like really hard to imagine rock without him. But yeah, we, I mean, we have a lot of people with like thousands of commits and I'm, I'm really, really grateful to all of them because uh, like definitely if it had just been me, this language would be like nothing compared to what it is today. Thanks to them. What do you see as the relationship between rock and Elm? So uh, I, I think kind of the obvious one is like Elm on the front end, rock on the back end. Um, so that's uh, sort of like what we're doing at the company I work for now, a vendor, V E N D R. And basically we have a gigantic Elm front end that we've been very happy with and a uh, TypeScript on Node.js backend that we haven't been happy with. And so we're in the process of migrating that to Rock. We now have a little tiny bit of Rock in production. And the, basically the way we have that set up is that you can actually just call Rock functions directly from TypeScript. Um, took some time to get that set up, but it, it works now. And so basically that gives us this really nice incremental adoption story, kind of similar to how like um, people talk about getting like closure going in a Java shop or, or, um, or Kotlin or Scala, one function call at a time. So we have that set up now. Um, it turns out that that's actually something that Rock is, uh, is pretty good at. So yeah, basically like, I mean, there's definitely some cases where, you know, you don't need rock, uh, you, maybe you can just get away with Elm or vice versa. Um, like, you know, rock is also good for like making command line apps or, you know, I kind of like to think of it as a language for the sort of long tail of domains, uh, like use cases and Elm being a focused language is sort of never going to address that long tail, which is part of the reason I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> there's room for two languages here um, that, that have a lot of similarities. Could someone implement Elm as a standalone separate from the JavaScript, or do you need to make some fundamentally different language choices? You definitely could. And in fact, um, so Evan Chaplicki, who created Elm, uh, he he recently kind of mentioned this at the end of his uh, his Strange Loop talk this year, um, which was about the economics of programming languages. But at the end of the talk, he kind of mentions a little bit of a spoiler that he's actually got a version of Elm that is tightly integrated with a database, um, specifically Postgres, and actually compiles down to C. And so it's just like running basically just, you know, full speed. So there's no there's no JavaScript at all involved in that implementation. So definitely like, it's not like you couldn't just say, let's literally take Elm and apply it to more domains. I think that's more of a sort of philosophical design um, on, on Evan's part, where he's, he's really interested in saying like, let's take this one use case and try to make the language as great as we can at that one use case, rather than thinking about like, let's try to make it more broad uh, scoped, like I am with Rock. What are the biggest differences between Rock and Elm beyond just the different usage scenarios? Yeah, so there's a concept called platforms and applications, which I guess is the big one. And we'll probably talk about that later. So <laughs> I guess uh, some of the like smaller language level things are, um, so I guess the, the biggest one is that Rock is not curried, whereas Elm is. There's like a lot of uh, history of, of languages like Elm and Haskell and StandardML and OCaml that are all curried and Rock is not. Uh, that's, you know, I'm not going to get into like a ton of detail on these design decisions, uh, I guess, because we don't have uh, <laughs> enough time. We can go all day about them. But so that's one. Um, another one that I'm sure we'll talk about later is that the, uh, the sum types are anonymous. So this is like in Elm, you have uh, called custom types in Elm. Uh, Haskell calls them algebraic data types. Rust calls them enums. F sharp calls them discriminated unions. Um, there's a lot of different names for this thing, but they're all some types basically like you have a couple of different options for you know uh, what the thing could be. In Rock, those are anonymous. So uh, it, whereas in most of those other languages, they are uh, sort of, you, you have to declare the type ahead of time. OCaml is maybe an exception there because OCaml has a separate feature in addition to having the like declare it named, they also have something they call polymorphic variants, which let you declare them anonymously. But basically in Rock, you can always um, declare them anonymously. This might sound like kind of a, edge case esoteric detail. But the one use case that we really designed this for and the reason that it's in the language is that it makes for this amazing story around error handling. So basically, if I do a bunch of IO operations in a row, like I do like a file read, and then I do an HTTP get, and then I do like a file write, all of the things that could go wrong with all of those things are just going to get automatically aggregated because of this feature. And then I can do a pattern match that says, oh, let's see if there was a file read failure, then I'll do this. If there was a file write failure, I'll do that. If there was an HTTP failure, I'll do that. And it captures exactly all the things that could go wrong and like doesn't let you forget to handle them. But it's also not overbroad in that it, it doesn't also make you handle errors that couldn't have happened. Like so Rust has a sort of generic IO error, which in some cases asks you to handle things that could not possibly have happened because you're like, it's like, hey, what if the network was disconnected? And I'm like, this is a file read. What are you talking about? And like, okay, there's like network file systems and stuff. Maybe that's not the best example, but you know what I mean? There's, there's some things that don't always make sense. 
So I love that about that system. And that was definitely one of the things that I talked to Evan about. And we both were immediately like, this might be cool, but it's like way too late to add that to Elm. That would be such a huge breaking change. Like you can't, <laughs> you can't do that at this, at this stage of the game. But that was something that I, you know, with Rock sort of being able to start from scratch, I was able to try out and it's worked out really well. Oh, that sounds awesome. So does Rock use linked lists like in many other functional languages? Are there any standardized uh, support for arrays? So linked lists are not part of the standard library. You can make one yourself, like a, the traditional cons list. Uh, we have like head and tail. Certainly can make one. But basically in Rock, we have this. Uh, so I guess another difference between Rock and Elm is that we're sort of uh, making a bet on this idea of, I, I like to call it opportunistic mutation. There's some literature that calls it functional, but in place. Basically, the idea is, let's imagine that I have some value that is semantically immutable. And I'm like, hey, I want to take this, let's, let's pretend it's a linked list, whatever. It's a, it's a list of a bunch of things. And I'm like, I want to uh, modify the third element in this list. Well, so traditionally, if that thing's immutable, then you're like, okay, well, I'm going to take the one that I have and I have to give you back a copy that has the third element changed. And if you can you know, imagine like how expensive that would be if you had like the entire thing, you had to clone the whole thing, you don't want to do that. So the traditional answer to this in functional programming is node sharing, where you say, okay, well, I'm just going to give you back like a new list that's got like, you know, the pointers done a little bit differently. And so I'm actually sharing a bunch of stuff with the old list. What we're trying is something different than that. So what we're trying is uh, this opportunistic mutation idea, which is basically we do reference counting for uh, memory management, automatic reference counting. So it's not a tracing garbage collector. It's, it's still like a automatic, so you don't have to you know, do anything manually. But behind the scenes, that means that we know when something is unique. That is to say, nobody else is referencing it. It's never going to get used ever again. So what we do is whenever we detect that, we say, well, you know what? We don't need to clone this thing. We'll just reuse it. We'll just, we'll just mutate the third thing in place and then just continue on our merry way because we know for sure that nobody else is ever going to use this thing ever again. So what's cool about that is that it means that in the happy path scenario, we can be as fast as like C++ or Rust with, with some of these things um, or, or like, you know, asymptotically close to it, like extremely close. There is like maybe one little conditional to check to see if it, the reference count was one. But actually, in a lot of cases, we can like even elide that thanks to the morphic checker, which is really cool at compile time. So in some scenarios, it's, it's literally as fast as like a C++ or a Rust um, because we're using like a, a standard array in memory. Now, the reason I call this like sort of a bet or a hypothesis is that we don't know for sure if this is always going to work out great. Like it might be the case that maybe in practice, it turns out that you actually do a lot of sharing. And so they're not unique as often as we thought they would be. And then maybe it ends up being a performance problem. There's kind of no way to know without trying it out though. And the reason I think it's a, it's a good bet is that in Rust, this is actually enforced with a pretty complicated type system. And so what ends up happening is that you do end up passing around these unique values and it seems to work out great. Like it seems like you, you very rarely have to clone something. And when you do, what you generally do in Rust is not like, you know, either you make it, make it be reference counted or you uh, explicitly clone it. And so my feeling is, uh, you know, th there's a good reason to believe that this will work out to be uh, like really great in terms of performance. So far it has. That sounds great. Does Rock have anything like trace or type classes? Yes. Um, so we have something called abilities. So this is our sort of uh, ad hoc polymorphism <laughs> construct. Basically the way that it works is it's kind of like a stripped down version of Rust traits. So unlike Haskell type classes, they aren't higher kinded. So you can't make like a monad ability that, I mean, you can try, but it's not, it's not really going to work. <laughs> I, I have an FAQ entry on, on higher kinded types in Rock, <laughs> but, uh, but basically it's a way that you can define like equals, for example, on your type, you can say like, I'm going to customize what equals does, or I'm going to customize what hash does, or I'm going to customize what like sorting does. One pretty cool thing about this is that we have an ability called uh, encoding and decoding. And basically what that does is it gives you a way to define, like given this type, and given some description of what I'm encoding or decoding into, um, this is kind of inspired by the Sirty library in Rust. Basically, it's a way to say like, you know, how do I turn this into JSON or CSV or whatever? And so what that means is you can basically say, if I have some sort of trivial decoding where I'm going to decode from JSON and it's going to go straight into exactly the type that I have here, like, you know, I don't need to do any transformations on it, anything custom. You don't need to write an explicit decoder, but also if you get a decoding error, it's going to happen right at the, at the time you were decoding. So like the JavaScript approach is kind of like, well, and TypeScript also is like, well, let's just assume we got the right shape. And if it turns out you were wrong, then potentially very distant from where the decoding happened, you're going to get a, you know, a type mismatch of like, you know, something was the wrong type or was null or, or something like that. Elm's approach is you explicitly write a decoder. So you get the error right away, 
But something that I've seen people complain about, and also in particular, something that resonates with me is I've seen beginners get confused by, and I actually wrote the most popular like <laughs> decoding library to help like de decode pipeline, which everybody uses. But I, I would always teach beginners this and I would see them get confused by what it was doing. And so that was something that was like more of a motivation for me is like, you, you still can do it that way. And that's definitely the way to do it if you need any customizations. And arguably that's the way you should always do it for that's kind of a separate discussion. But having that option means that beginners can get up and running faster, if nothing else, which I really like. Speaking of types, Rock uses tags instead of explicit enum or some types, and the tags aren't namespaced, making them sort of like string literals in TypeScript. How does this work out in practice? So far, it's worked out great. So there's there's a couple of interesting trade-offs to do with that. So one is that, yes, the tags are not namespaced, but generally speaking, the way that they're used is when you're just saying like, I have like one of several options here. And you might actually wrap that up in what's called an opaque type, which means that what the different options are inside of it is kind of hidden. And at that point, you don't really have the same kind of like concern over like, well, maybe I'm going to accidentally, you know, pass this thing. And I think that it's referring to this type, but it's actually referring to this type. As soon as you wrap it in an opaque type, it's like those two are completely incompatible. And so you get the same kind of nominal typing is, is I guess the term for this that you would see in languages where uh, all some types are nominal or nominally typed. But, the, but like I said, the, the real big advantage of that is in the, like the error handling, uh, the error sort of accumulation. And so I would say overall, it's worked out great in practice because the upside of the error accumulation has worked out really well. And we haven't really seen any downsides in practice so far of you know the theoretical downsides that could happen because they're all in the same namespace. And going with that sort of non-namespaced idea, rock structs are structurally typed. And so I was here to curious how you make that efficient in terms of the machine code you produce. Like how do you determine things like field order, if you get two different structs that like they don't quite match and well, maybe one is a superset of the other, so on and so forth. How do you deal with that kind of stuff? That's a great question. And that's it for the first half of the interview. To catch the answer to this question and the rest of the interview, head on over to Code Next Door, link in the description.